right, so I am excited about this series, um, Outside In, talking about emotions, because this is something we deal with every day, and I know us females can go on a bit of an emotional roller coaster, so it can be a lot. It's easy to become overwhelmed and get all up in our feelings, as y'all young kids like to say, but we wanted to do this series so that we could become aware of our emotions but overcome them instead of being overwhelmed by them. So tonight we're going to focus on insecurity and fear. And I'm going to speak from a place of vulnerability because these are two emotions that I have wrestled with for years. I've struggled with them many times. And as Pastor Jill said on Sunday, um, many of the messages that Pastor Zach preaches are things that they have walked through. And that's true because we cannot preach a message that hasn't first convicted and transformed our hearts and minds. Because we cannot expect it to be effective and do that for others if we haven't first seen it in our own lives. Um, And so that's why I'm speaking from a place of vulnerability. Throughout my teenage years and into adulthood, I've struggled to take on the identity of Christ and to be rooted in his truth about me. I've struggled to believe that his goodness is for me the way it is for others, and I've lacked confidence in myself and his power at work within me. And when I did feel confident, it many times came from a place of pride or my own certainty within my own abilities. And in the end, that left me right where I started, defeated and unsure, full of fear and uncertainty. But the Lord has recently been moving in my heart and mind, ironically, as I speak about insecurity and fear, deconstructing all of my disbelief and reassuring me of his power at work within me. And so that's why I stand here tonight. He's doing the work slowly but surely. But I'm also going to speak from a place of confidence and hope because we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus and we've seen his power at work in our lives. So tonight you can turn to Romans 12 verses 1 through 2. This may be a familiar passage. It's one of my favorites. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. And it says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray one more time. Jesus, we love you. Tonight we come to you humbly and vulnerable as we face our emotions. We ask that you would come and be Lord over our lives, be Lord over our minds, Jesus. Bring everything into perfect order through your power at work within us. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. I pray, Father, that you would silence every lie of the enemy in the room. That you would be near to us, Father, that we would feel your nearness, for we know you are at hand. Would you come with a peace that passes all understanding and set our minds on you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we continue on tonight, we're going to see how those two verses will be the turning point in our emotions. When we submit ourselves to God and renew our minds through his word, we will see his transforming power at work in us. So tonight I want to define our emotions, get to the root of them, and then dedicate ourselves to overcoming them. So the first thing I want to define is an emotion. What is an emotion? It's a natural, instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationships with others. A natural, instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationship with others. An insecurity is an uncertainty 
or anxiety about oneself. It's a lack of confidence. Uncertainty or anxiety about oneself. And fear is a feeling of anxiety concerning the outcome of something or the safety and well-being of someone. It's the likelihood of something unwelcome happening. A feeling of anxiety concerning the outcome. And so there's an underlying theme in those two definitions for insecurity and fear, and it's anxiety. But it also defines anxiety to be the lack of confidence and uncertainty. And so I thought that was crazy to think about because we feel anxiety many times and sometimes we don't know where it comes from. And many times it's from a lack of confidence and uncertainty. And it has to do with us wanting to kind of control the situations and outcomes and know what's happening. And I struggle with that a lot. I like to know what's going on. And there's a root to all of these emotions, and it stems from the root of unbelief. And so I'm going to talk about unbelief a little bit more in a minute. But that's going to bring us to determining the beginning of these emotions. We see these emotions from the beginning, starting in Genesis and all throughout the Bible. We see it first in Eve when she conversates with the serpent and believes his words over the word of God. She forfeited closeness with God for temporary pleasure and a false sense of power. We see it in Cain when he killed his own brother because his brother's offering was better. Because he came to the Lord nonchalantly with an offering that wasn't pleasing to the Lord, he allowed insecurity to overcome him through jealousy and rage that caused the shedding of innocent blood. And we see it in Jacob when he deceives his father for his brother's birthright. He resented his brother as firstborn and worked in deception to move out of the feeling of being inferior. We see it in Saul when he realizes a new king is being raised up to take his place. He was insecure in his position and fearful of losing his power. And we see it in Elijah when he had all the prophets of Baal killed and Jezebel found out and threatened his life. He let go of his security and the God who had just answered by fire, and so he fled in fear, relinquishing the authority at work within him, leaving an unfinished work for whoever would come next to have to take care of. And we see it in doubting Thomas, who refused to believe without seeing. We see it in the disciples many times when they failed to operate in the confidence that Jesus was trying to extend to them as those who would soon carry on his work after he ascends to the right hand of the Father. And that goes on and on. So one thing I noticed in that is that these emotions have been passed down since the beginning from generation to generation. And it's extended from that root of unbelief I mentioned a minute ago. It's the unbelief that God is fully and only good and that we are made in his image and for his purpose. That he knows and does what is best for us. And this root has continuously stemmed out causing other things like lack of certainty and lack of confidence, intimidation and comparison, inferiority, identity crisis, jealousy, idolatry, and so on. And this is what happens when we don't take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. It's a battle of the mind. And when the thoughts and the emotions are not submitted to Christ, we begin to unravel and give way to the enemy forfeiting our peace. Our emotions start in our mind. One of my favorite speakers said and really put things into perspective, she said, fear is invoked by some level of idolatry because something else is consuming our mental energy more than the power of God. Fear is invoked by some level of idolatry because something else is consuming our mental energy more than the power of God. We must not allow idolatry or what we want more through fear of other things to become greater than our fear of God. We must not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. 
2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. We must resolve that we will be the generation of those who seek his face, that we will be countercultural, and instead of allowing our emotions to rule us, our emotions will be ruled by the word of God. That the generational curse of refusing to submit our emotions to Christ would be broken here with us. How fitting that we just went through the armor of God right before this series on emotions. Because we talked about how we need it to suit up and prepare for every attack of the enemy. And the enemy comes to attack our mind. Because when we forget begin to feel these emotions and allow them to control and overtake us, we begin to believe that what we are feeling above the truth of God's word and what he speaks over us. So we need that armor to extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy who likes to use our emotions against us and cause chaos in our thought process. And if we're not suited up, then we will fall victim to his fiery darts. Our emotions are not bad things, but it is the lens through which we choose to discern and react to them that causes us trouble. We must be aware of them, what triggers them, and how to respond when they arise. We look at that through the lens of God's word, the word of truth. Our emotions are not the objective truth. They are subjective to our situations. They are not constant and unchanging, but change constantly, so we cannot base truth from them. There is one thing that is fully and only true, that is God. And he has given his word that does not change and will never pass away. We need our emotions to be rooted in that truth, so when insecurity and fear arise, we take up the sword of the spirit, which rightly divides. We need to put on the belt of truth that counteracts the lies of the enemy. The helmet of salvation that guards our minds and assures us of our heritage. The breastplate of righteousness that protects our inner being. The shoes of peace to help us come against the chaos. And the shield of faith to extinguish every attack of the enemy and put our minds and emotions back in check. We defined in the beginning that emotions are a natural, instinctive state of mind. You see, we're born into a sinful nature, but when we are reborn, we take on the nature of God. And what was once natural is now dreadful, and what was once unattainable, we now take on as our own. We have exchanged natures and stepped into new life. This new life requires a new mind, which is renewed through the transforming word of God that is alive and powerful. We begin to see change in our lives, in our minds, in our thought, pres thought processes, in our families, in our school, when we're renewed by the word of God daily. So you may be asking the question, why am I struggling with this? How did this take root in my life? And my answer to that is this. We are struggling with an identity crisis because of our unbelief. I said in the beginning that I've struggled to believe that God's goodness was for me and to believe that the truth that he speaks over me. And I believe that is true for many of us. We live in this place of insecurity and fear because we do not know or believe our identity. Sometimes we hear what the Lord has spoken about us, that we're a royal priesthood, a, a chosen generation, and we just let it roll off of our backs because it's become so normal to us that we hear it and see it in school and at church and from our parents that we just forget to stop and take a moment and realize the truth in that. 
We are children of God, the light of the world, a city set on a hill. We were made for royalty, born into the kingdom of God, who grafted us into his family through Jesus, who gave his life for us. His blood makes us new. And so because we don't believe our identity we sit in this place of discouragement that we are not enough, that others are better than us, that someone else can do it better. We're not creative enough. We don't have the passion or the intelligence for that. And we're afraid to move because we might be rejected or fail at whatever we set our hands to. And I want to to go back to the story of Elijah that I mentioned in the beginning about his fear and insecurity and the devastation that it caused. So I'm going to summarize it very short. You can read the whole thing throughout First and Second Kings. It's a lot, and there will be a lot more details in there than I can give you. But Elijah was a mighty prophet for the Lord. He challenged the prophets of Baal. Baal was a false god that they worshipped and built statues to. But he challenged those prophets and they lost because you cannot serve a false god and expect the power of the living God to come forth. That's why it's so important what we give our time and our attention to because if we're not careful, it'll become an idol that we begin to worship and we place it above God's place in our lives. So we want to make sure we dethrone every idol and place God on the throne of our hearts, giving him room to move and work within us. After that, he had all the prophets of Baal killed. And Jezebel, who is a Baal worshiper, she found out about this and she was enraged. She sent a message to Elijah threatening to have him killed. Elijah receives this message and flees in fear of his life, now unable to fulfill the will of the Lord because he was no longer able to discern God's perfect will. The Lord instructs him to anoint Elisha in his place and anoint a new king over Israel. Because he bowed back in insecurity and fear, someone had to be set in his place to carry out the will of the Lord. Elisha was anointed with a double portion, even greater than Elijah had. And Jehu, Jehu, the new king, was given the confidence to face Jezebel and defeat her. Because the perfect will of the Lord is that all evil be overcome. What should have stopped with Elijah continued because of his inability to overcome his emotions and to submit them to the Lord. And through that delay, 70 sons of Jezebel were raised. She was a wicked woman, and she produced wickedness. And when I read this story, I likened her and her sons to the different things that we wrestle with, different principalities and powers that we face. The spirits that come against us to tear us down so that we bow in defeat. The spiritual wickedness that we talked about in the Armor of God series. I likened her to intimidation and deceit. And I likened her sons to things such as inferiority, jealousy, comparison, competition, lack of confidence, resentment, rage, pride, and so on. This is the way the enemy takes our emotions and turns them to evil. He starts with one thought and begins to, to twist it and turn it and make us feel a certain way to where we have no confidence and to where we forget the word of the Lord. Jezebel was allowed to rule for so long because she operated in that spirit of intimidation and deceit. People refused to stand against her because they believed she held so much power. But I said before she was a Baal worshiper. And Baal is a little G God, okay? He's not the one true living God. So she served a God with absolutely no power 
She served a God that could not respond or talk or his spirit couldn't cover the earth the way the waters cover the sea. She served a God with no power. There is one true living God. So her power was only valid when it was given to her through those who feared her. That's where her power came from, intimidating and belittling somebody to where they felt she had power that she really didn't have. And it continued on until J.Q. came. And so as we wrap up tonight, I want to ask you, what have you allowed to intimidate you? What lies have you come into agreement with? I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not cool enough. I'll be rejected. No one loves me. No one sees me. Someone could do this better than me. I'm not qualified. What lies have you come into agreement with? What is it that you fear more than God? Is it the approval of men? Is it what somebody will say of you if you stand out? What is it that you fear more than God? Is it the fact that one day we'll all die? Is it the fact that you may lose someone you love? But what I want to tell you tonight is that we fail to realize the power in this. That God sent his only son Jesus into the world who is fully God and fully man. Meaning he was able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he felt the emotions that we feel and he faced the temptations that we face. But he was able to overcome through the power of God at work within him. Which is the same God at work within us through the power of Holy Spirit gifted to us through the resurrection of Jesus. We may not be strong enough or good enough on our own, but we are not alone. We have the power of Almighty God working on the inside of us to fulfill his good purpose. He has equipped us with everything we need to live a godly life. He has given us the scriptures to reference and apply in our time of need. And I have a few of those I, I want you guys to write down so that you can refer to later on when you feel the insecurity and fear arise and you feel like you're all alone. Second Timothy 1 7. For the spirit God gave does not make us timid, but gives us power, love. And self-discipline. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. 1 Corinthians 2.16 For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. John 8, says that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. There is no truth in him. We just recently went to a conference and, and the speaker there said that he came to the point where he would hear the lies of the enemy. And so he told the enemy, give me the book and verse. Where is that in the Bible? Because the Bible is the only truth. So you tell me where that is and I'll believe it. So that's something I've started to apply in my life. Devil Book and verse. Book and verse, devil. There is no truth in you. And I will believe the word of the Lord, the only truth. 
Revelations 12, 11 says that we triumph over the accuser, which is the devil, the father of lies, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Confession is a form of warfare. The enemy would like us to sit back and drown in darkness all alone because your feelings come from what you feed on and what you feed on comes from what you focus on. So he wants us to focus on our insecurities and our um, inabilities. He wants us to focus on what we're not good at. But I'm here to challenge you tonight. Feed on the word of God. Focus on his promises that are yes and amen. Focus on his power that's never failed. The triumph we have is joint heirs in Jesus. So take these next few moments and think about his goodness and let that be what feeds us. The truth that he speaks over us as his children. You've probably heard it a thousand times before, but I'm going to declare it over you tonight. And I hope it takes root within your heart in a new way you haven't felt before. And the truth is that we are his children. We will do greater things in his name than he did when he walked the earth. We are children of God grafted into his family and seated with him at the right hand of the father as co-heirs. We operate in the same authority that Jesus did when he walked the earth, casting out demons, healing the sick, restoring sight to the blind, feeding thousands. And we have been given everything we need for a godly life. We are overcomers, and we have the mind of Christ, the mind who knows all things, who sees all things. We have this hope as an anchor for our souls. Uh, Jesus died, but he's coming back again to carry us home. If we'll focus on this moment right now and we'll say, I will resolve to let the Lord reign over my emotions. I will resolve to believe his truth over every lie of the enemy. I will resolve to read my Bible and memorate scripture. I will resolve to stand out in the crowd and refuse to sit back and do what everybody else is doing just so I don't have to be alone. I will resolve to step out in faith. I will resolve to believe that I will always be overcome by fear and insecurity. I will resolve to believe that I can't do what I want to do or that what I, I can't do what the Lord has called me to do. He has graced each of you and equipped each of you with everything that you need. And the only thing that you need is his spirit at work within you. Because he does everything else. When we surrender and we release and we act in obedience, he comes on the scene and he does everything. He just asks us to to stand firm in faith, suited up in the armor, ready and willing to do whatever he asks, to go wherever he calls us to go. And it can be a scary thing because we don't see and know it all. But we know who sees and knows it all. And he's never failed. And he will never fail. He's seated on the throne. He's taken the power of death, hell, and the grave. And he's given it to us for new life. So now I want to challenge you in this moment. To step forward in faith and confidence that God is able and willing to deliver and lead you on. Our God is a consuming fire and he's able to overcome all that consumes us. So if in this moment you want to resolve that my emotions will not overcome me, but the power of God at work within me will overcome my emotions. I want you to step forth. I want to pray over you guys. If you feel that right now, I want to be free from insecurity and fear. I don't want my emotions to control me. I want you to just step forth. And I'm just going to pray over everybody who steps forth.
Jesus, what? You have created every good thing and you have called us a good thing. We submit our minds and our lives to you. We ask that you would come and meet us in this moment. This moment of insecurity and fear. This moment where our emotions overwhelm us. And we face hardship day in and day out. I pray that you would meet us in this moment. Strengthen us by the power of your might. Renew our minds. Transform our lives, Jesus. Set us free. Let us walk into your freedom, Jesus. May we experience your presence and power like never before. We resolve here in this moment to stand on your truth. To walk in your peace that surpasses all understanding. We resolve that the joy of the Lord will be our strength. That we will be strong and mighty in battle because you are strong within us. And that it's your power that pushes us on to do your good work. We resolve to stay in your will. To stand on your promises. We will not be overcome by the world or by the tactics of the enemy because we are overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And our testimony is this. You are higher. You are greater. You, enthr you are enthroned in our lives. You are enthroned upon our praises. Inhabit your people, Jesus. Set your seal of approval upon us. Because we have confidence in this, that you who began a good work will bring it to completion on the day of Christ. And until then, you continue to work within us. You have given us everything we need for a godly life. You have graced us with your goodness. We will not be bound by our emotions. but we will be bound to you, Jesus. We resolve to be the generation of those who will seek your face. We will resolve to be the, those with clean hands and pure hearts who ascend the hill of the Lord. We will not bow in reverence to idols, Jesus, but you are the one true living God and you are the one we will serve. You are the one we will look to. We step into your freedom, Jesus, and we take on your nature. We take on your nature. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Allow the Lord to do whatever he wants to do in your life. Be obedient without any hesitation, for he is always greater, and you will see his transforming power at work within your life. We love you guys. We hope you have a great week. Thanks for being with us.